Okay, we'll go and get started. I have it 6.05. Uh, first of all, like I said a minute ago, it is great to see so many of your faces and I look forward to seeing more and more of you in person as the weeks and months go by. Um, know that we're fully open now. The only service you need to register for is Friday nights. Um, and we're allowing up to 135 people on Friday nights. We're in the Bark Sanctuary. So we feel it's very safe. Um, we really have been open the whole time, but now um, even more so as more and more of us get vaccinated. So we'd love to see you, whether it's a weekday service in our chapel, on Friday night, Shabbat morning, more and more programs will be in person as the weeks and months go by. So it's just a beautiful springtime here at Beth Yashurin as we come out of this pandemic, opening up, um, allowing you to, you know, see your friends, be part of the community again. And I want to wish everybody a Hag Sameach, a good Passover. And to begin, I want to thank um, the incredible women of our extraordinary sisterhood who are sponsoring this evening. Um, they always put together great programs for us, whether it's in person or virtually. And they've been there again for our community during this pandemic, planning so many great virtual programs. So thank you to Vicki and to Barbara and all the women of sisterhood um, for making this happen this evening. So tonight we have a very special guest. I am honored to welcome Dr. Edith Eva Eager. Dr. Eager is a native of Hungary and was just 16 years old in 1944 when she experienced one of the worst evils the human race has ever known. As a Jew living in Nazi occupied Eastern Europe, she and her family were sent to Auschwitz the death camp. Her parents lost their lives there. She and her sister survived even though they were subjected to horrible treatment like Dr. Josef Mengele and survived the death march to Austria. In 1949, she and her young family moved here to America. And in 1969, she received her degree in psychology from the University of Texas, El Paso. And then she pursued her doctoral internship at the William Beaumont Army Medical Center at Fort Bliss, Texas. She spent much of her professional time working with members of the military, helping them to recover from and cope with the ongoing effects of PTSD. Dr. Eager has always found ways to use her personal experiences to inspire, educate, and help others. She has a clinical practice in California where she uses her past as a powerful analogy to inspire people to reach their potential and shape their destinies. In the fall of 2017, at the age of 90, her memoir, The Choice, Embrace the Possible, was published at the age of 90. And in her book, she details how the synergy of working with and learning from her patients' perspectives has enriched her life experiences and outlook. The book focuses on moving forward in light of hardship, has received excellent reviews, was a New York Times bestseller, was translated into more, into more than 30 languages, it was internationally acclaimed. Oprah Winfrey said of the book, I will forever be changed by Edith Eager's story. And in March, 2018, the book received two awards, one for the National Organization of the Jewish Book Council and the other the Christopher Award. Her second book, The Gift, 12 Lessons to Save Your Life was released in September of 2020 and immediately became a bestseller in the UK and Ireland. In this book, she gave actionable advice to assist every person facing life difficult, life's difficulties in a positive and healthy manner. The gift is being translated into more than 20 languages. Many of you may remember that I spoke about Dr. Eager in her book, The Choice on Colton Dre. It had a tremendous effect on me and my outlook on life as a second generation survivor, as a rabbi and as a Jew. So it is honored, it's an honor for me and for all of us at Bethy Shur and Dr. Eager to welcome you to our congregation. We wish you could be here in person, but this is just as almost as good to spend some time with you this evening, to learn from you and to be enriched by your wisdom, your life experiences and your practical know-how on how to help all of us overcome the challenges we face. So let's get to it. I'll have a series of questions for Dr. Eager and then at the end of my questions for Dr. Eager, you'll have a chance to answer, ask your own questions. Everyone will be muted, but you can go into our chat room on our, on our Zoom chat and type in your question. 
and we'll get to as many questions as we can before 7 p.m. Houston time. Dr. Eager is visiting us this evening from San Diego, California. And so Dr. Eager, for those of us who may be unfamiliar with your story, tell us a little bit about your family and life in Hungary before the war. My, my family was filled with very talented people. My sister Magda, played the piano and my sister Clara was playing the violin, the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto at a very early age, like five or six. She was the only Jew accepted at the music conservatory in Budapest. And when she was already taken to the camp, her professor smuggled her out and hit her until the end of the war. The way I found out that she was alive, when I was taken on the top of a train from Vienna to Prague, I saw advertisements that she's giving a concert. And of course, that was a tremendous blessing and I lost my whole family. But my sister went to Australia. She was part of the, of the wonderful museum that I hope you go to. And, uh, she was part of the Sydney uh, Opera House and um, playing the violin. And she put me in the Queen's Lodge to see, to see the, uh, the wonderful ballet when Brian Bajishnikov came. So I have wonderful memories of the Jewish community, especially in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. My early life was very interesting because my parents wanted to have a son after two girls. And when I was three years old, I became cross-eyed. So my sisters um, put blinders on me so no one would see how ugly I was. And my mom looked at me very, very seriously. I think I was about nine, eight, nine years old, 10 years old, very seriously, she said to me, I'm so glad you have brains because you have no looks. <laughs> and I think today I ask people to really remember uh, the messages they carry still with us and uh, not to worry about that anymore, but to be able to rewrite their script and to be recognizing that everything hopefully Every suffering that we had done made us stronger. So yeah. I'm here now, 93. I think young, as I told you, but I'm not smart, I'm wise. And you know what? Your women in a congregation can more things, can do everything in no time at all because they're organized, they're responsible, and that reminds me of my mother when she made the holla Friday night. It was an art piece, you know. It was just an amazing smell all over the house. And, you know, we had a beautiful, beautiful seder. And my father got up in March 1944 and kissed us on our heads. And a few hours later, there was a banging on our doors. And they picked us up and eventually taking us to Auschwitz in May 1944. You know, I always want to mention one thing, that unfortunately genocide are with us, but never in the history of mankind such a scientific and systematic in the allusion of people existed when they were celebrating at the end of the day, 15 highly educated people, that they can put 30,000 Jewish people, children into the oven without even gassing them in one day. So I am very, very proud of my inheritance because because we were slaves and we, 
we were in the desert, but they will never gave up. And that's the blood I carry. I'm a very proud Jew. I cannot tell you how proud I am that not only I survived, but I'm able to be useful to other people. I never ask my patients, how can I help you? I say, how can I be useful to you? Because, because you have it in you, and whatever you discovered in Auschwitz, the most important thing is that you found out that the more you depend on other people, the less you're going to make it. If you were just for the me, 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 you never made it. That all we had was each other now. And my, my teacher from my Jewish school was there. And when Dr. Mengele came in and wanted to be entertained, the teacher pushed me and said, do as I told you, go. And that's how I ended up then dancing for Dr. Mengele. Do you remember still what it was like to have to dance in front of him? I cannot tell you that those eyes I never forget. Those eyes were piercing at me. As he said, your mother is just going to take a shower. And then threw me on the other side, which my sister. So I ended up with this couple. And uh, she tore out my earrings. And, and I finally said, uh, when will I see my mother? And she pointed at the, at, the at the fire, at the chimney coming out from the gas chamber. And she told me, your mother is burning there. You better talk about her in past tense. And my sister hugged me, and she said, the spirit never dies. So that's why I am glad that I was able to uh, dance for Dr. Mengele and do what I was told in the daytime. But at night, I was still dreaming and dancing. And the music was Tchaikovsky, and I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet at the Budapest Opera House. That's the first thing I did when I went back to Budapest to lecture with Philip Zimbardo. I went to the Budapest Opera House. And so I am just so proud to come from the blood that made it in the desert, that made it somehow through the Holocaust, and of course the state of Israel that came out. So I was telling people that in Poland, people were not allowed to go to public school, and they put them in a ghetto. And in a ghetto, what kept us really is the humor. And do you know Sholem Aleichem? Can yeah. I tell you one thing that he said? Please. He said, he said, why is the ocean water so salty? And the answer is because of all the herrings in it. But then one of the rabbis told me it's because all the tears. That, so whichever way, but I think humor was very important for us to be able to wonder whether we're going to take a shower and if we do, whether water is going to come out or gas. We didn't know what was going to happen next. And this is what we're experiencing now. We were told one thing and we found another. We were not prepared for this. So I'm hoping that people recognize that it's temporary and we can survive it. There were so many aspects of your book that I found so inspiring. And I want to bring up one. You mentioned your mother earlier. Dr. Eager, you wrote in your book, On the Way to Auschwitz, your mother said to you, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. But nobody yes. can take away from you what you put in your own mind. Exactly. And I know that advice became your survival mechanism. And
and help you make an important distinction between victimization and victimhood. Exactly. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, because uh, when people introduce me that she's a survivor, I want to say I am a human being who went through an experience, but it's not my identity. I'm not a victim. I was victimized. It's not who I am. It's what was done to me. And of course, I learned and discovered that the more suffering I had, the stronger I became. And that's what I'm hoping for people recognize that love is not what we feel, it's what we do. And we commit each other to each other. We, we empower each other with our differences that you can be you and I can be you, and, but not, not, never be your uniqueness and your one of a kindness. So I talk a great deal about the difference between victims or survivors. And I think it's very important to know that you cannot be a victim without a victimizer. So when you ask a child, why do you do that? The kid would say, because I feel like it. Children don't care about consequences, but as an adult, I still feel like it because God gave me temptation. Why? So I can practice the freedom of choice. I love my Hungarian chocolate cake, but you know, I was beaten very severely. And when I was liberated, I was put in a hospital and I was, I was put in, in a cast and realized that my parents are not coming back. So I think it's very important, hopefully, to use this time and look at the traits of a victim. Victims usually are rigid thinkers, either or, all or nothing, life or death. And victims blame, you know, blaming is only for children. As an adult, I don't blame. I don't ask why me, I say, what now? And that's what happened that my husband was put in jail because the communists took over his business that great grandfather built hundreds of years ago. And they put him in a jail and I asked, what now? And I took a big diamond ring. I put this bracelet in my little girl's diaper and I went to the jail. I gave the ring to the warden and I smuggled my husband out and I came to Vienna in a Rothschild hospital. When I was in Miami, I told the Jewish community they are extremely generous, wonderful people. And I told them that maybe they're helping today out to a young mother like me because the Rothschild hospital gave me food and gave me a place to stay. And so I think it's very important that we Jewish people care for our brothers and sisters. And that's what happened in Auschwitz. We had each other and we had to form a family of inmates. So on that idea of helping us grow, not looking at ourselves as victims, you know, I often remember from uh, C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce in his book, the narrator visits a gray suburb of hell and finds it populated by souls who are self-imprisoned and capable of freedom because their personalities are reduced to old grievances, gripes, protests. They still see themselves as victims. They can't escape. And his book is powerful because too often we have seen the hell that some choose to remain in for their entire lives. And all of us struggle. We've all been victims at some point. But how can we help ourselves and others build a brighter future and escape that hell that some mm. people still find themselves in? I don't think that there is anyone here who is not a victim of victims. 
That's why we stop blaming and we learn to learn that what we think we create. So think hope in hopelessness. I think everything begins what my mother told me, that they, everything can be taken away from me and totally was there in our nakedness. And I remember my sister Magda, who was the pretty one, asked me, how do I look? And I had a choice then, as we have a choice now, whether I pay attention to what I lost or what is still there. And I remember Magda, I don't know if you know Georgia Gabor, my sister can call me today and tells me I'm gorgeous. Yes, she's 100 years old and she will tell you that she's 99. I don't know why Hungarian women <laughs> cut a little bit off all the time, but I told my sister Magda, Magda, you have beautiful eyes and I didn't see it when you had your hair all over the place. So point out what is and we, and we say anything, ask yourself, is it very important? Is it very necessary? And don't tell your child you're pretty, but you're fat and pimply. Just get, give me the but and I give you an end. Yes, and, and pay attention what you're paying attention to. Any behavior you pay attention to, you reinforce that behavior. Hmm. You Good can advice. change your thinking, you can change your life, yes. Yeah. It's kind of what, and you mentioned in your book and one of my favorite sayings from Viktor Frankl, a fellow mm -hmm. survivor is, there's some, yes. one thing no one can take away from you is the choice you make inside. Yes. And you can choose attitude, how you perceive the situation. Yes, we worked together. He, uh, he was a beautiful man of 70s, and he was climbing the Alps, and he was taking flying lessons. It was quite wonderful, and uh, I learned a great deal, and I am a diplomat in logotherapy myself. And it's about the existential phenomenological. Uh, when I was liberated, and I got up, I didn't say what. I said, what for? Because while I was there, I was still, still thinking, if I survive today, then tomorrow I'm gonna see my parents. Tomorrow I'm gonna see my boyfriend. And we were very militant, very militant. We're gonna go to Palestine and we're going to fight for Palestine, we had a goal together. And then I found out that he was killed the day before liberation. And then I found out that my parents are not coming back. So when reality hit you, and that's why the more you spoil your children, I can tell you, you're not doing them any good because they were the first ones to die. They were waiting, 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 something to happen outside of themselves. All we had was each other then, and all we have is each other now. And I appreciate you thanking the women who are sponsoring tonight. And I also want to give you a standing ovation because that's what it took to go beyond the me, me, me and commit ourselves to each other. So speaking of the women here, um, at 40 years old, uh, Dr. Eager, you went back to school to pursue your degree in psychology. You were very busy. You were rebuilding your life in El Paso, and you were a mother. What would you say to women here tonight who are thinking of making similar life changes? I'm going to tell you that my supervisor told me to go get a doctorate, and I told him it's impossible. I'm 40. By the time I get a doctorate, I'll be way in the 50s, and he, that's his, he said to me one thing, you'll be 50 anyway. Just remember, the chronological age, you have no control of is what you do with it. 
So if there is a lawyer in you, and women are very good judges, you know, because we always tell children how not to fight each other and not to blame each other. So children give us a reason, and then we don't know what to do with the reason. <laughs> so, so don't ask ever your children a why question. Why did you hit your brother? Because he hit me first. And then say, don't lie to me. And then I'll say, if you don't want your child to lie, don't ask why. <laughs> now, speaking of your work, I want to know, how did your education, this incredible work you've been doing now for over 50 years, help yes. you with your own healing? I think that what helped me most <clears throat> that I stopped running. And when I read my search for meaning, I remember that I have work to do. When I worked two paraplegics coming back from Vietnam, and one of them would be in like a fetal position, why me, and just blaming everything, everyone, from God to country. Conversely, the other one I always say was sent to me really by God because they had the same symptomatology and the same diagnosis, but two entirely different responses. This guy told me, you know, Doc, I am so grateful that I'm in a wheelchair because I can see my children's eyes much closer. I can see and touch the flowers. And here I was wearing a white coat. And it's a Dr. Eager Department of Psychiatry. And I feel inside as the biggest imposter. imposter that I came to America and went to school and school and school and school. And that's when I decided to go back to Auschwitz. So I went to my sister and I told her, I got to go back to Auschwitz. I cannot do that in an office of a psychiatrist. I got to go back to that lion's den. I got to look at that person. I got to reclaim my innocence and finally learning how to survive myself. And so that's what I did. My sister told me, I'm a total idiot, I'm a masochist. And we went through the same experience. But I'm so glad that the work I do and the theory that I developed is, uh, is learning how to feel the feelings rather than talk about the feeling, medicate the feeling, and get addicted to aboutness, about, about, about. And it was the most powerful journey that I took going back to Auschwitz going back to that lion's den and look at that lion in the face and reclaiming my innocence and assign the shame and guilt to the perpetrator. I think there is no rage. No rage. You got to go through the rage. You got to go through the valley of the shadow of death, but not to camp there. And my daughter calls it edisms. And one of them is, are you revolving or are you evolving? So I usually wear butterflies. I don't know why I don't today, uh, but I like the idea of going through the metamorphosis. So you want to do in Pesach, you want to ask yourself, what am I holding in onto and what am I willing to let go of? Because that's my definition of love the ability to let go. Let go of the need for other people's approval. So maybe if I go to one of the women um, tonight in your congregation and I say, I really would like to get to know you. I hope you would like to get to know me too. Me, Edie, you know, not Dr. Eager. And she said to me very seriously, that's very nice. I just want to tell you that I'm really not interested. 
So the best four-letter word in the English language starts with an R. What do you think it is? I don't know. You tell me. Risk. Risk. I risked. I asked what I wanted, and I didn't get it. But get rid of the word rejection, because no one rejects me but me. You have as much power over me as I. You know, I, if I play the kick me game, I, I wear a shirt and it says kick me. And some people do that because then they can be chronic victims. I think it's very important that any behavior satisfies a need and we want to look for the secondary gains. Because while you're a victim, it gives you an entitlement to do nothing, zero. But don't blame the victim. My parents didn't have a chance. Blaming is for children. While you blame, you're still a child. Well, like what you just said, it's easier to take risks if you can accept that others can't reject you, only you can reject yourself. And, 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 and then I found out where I stand with that person. So I have to give up my need to please everyone or seek approval, but most of all, I ask people to get rid of perfectionism because then you're competing with God. We are humans, we are fallible, we make mistakes. And it's very, very important for you to just accept that you're human and we do what's humanly possible and then hand it over. No doubt about that. You know, I remember the Kotzka Rebbe once said that perfectionism is the enemy of the good. It's oh, hard to be it's, uh, it's hard to be good. I, I, I think he was brilliant. So speaking of brilliant and risk taking was you wrote about in your book, how you stood outside of Hitler's home and yelled that you had chosen to forgive him, yeah. forgive him, forgive Hitler may his name be erased, or when you chose to forgive yourself for inadvertently sending your mother to the gas chambers by identifying her as mother and not sister. So how did that choice of forgiveness, forgiving yourself, enable you to move forward and help others? I don't have any godly power. I'm not in this world to forgive the Nazis. I'm in my world to free myself and give myself a gift. Because if I would live in hatred and fear, I would still be a prisoner. Why give Hitler a posthumous victory? No, it's not. No, it's, it's really amazing how, uh, how we are limited. I'm only human. And I do what's humanly possible. I will never, ever retire. I'm going to work as long as I do. Yesterday, I did a high kick with a ballerina who is very suicidal in another country, in another continent. And I asked her, she's 28 years old, doesn't want to live anymore. I said, we're going to die, and we're going to be dead for a long time. And besides, you won't find out what happened. So anyway, um, life is beautiful. And every moment, to me, is very precious. Because we don't seem to appreciate sometimes what we have until we lose it. And, and this is happening now. We don't have the freedom to go to a restaurant and, and have a lovely meal. I have to go outside. And, and they have a heater, or they don't have a heater, but it's not the same. Um, our freedom, just like my mother said, it gives you an opportunity to think about your thinking. And love is not what you feel, is what you do. And you are the role model to your children, the way you treat their mother. So I hope you bring her breakfast Saturday or Sunday morning. Or, uh, don't ask how are you. 
as as stupid as think. How are you? Fine. Did you have a good day? Uh, what do you want to do tonight? I don't know. What do you, I call it social noise. Gee, it's good to see you. I missed you. <laughs> so you see, doctors usually tell their wives, I'll be home at 7 o'clock. And then 7 o'clock comes and goes. And what does she do? I tell her to get down on her knee and take that pillow and beat it up. I have wonderful dinner for you and you and this and then and, and get it all out. Because the opposite of depression is expression. Get out all that rage, scream it out, and then you say, I can use this time for me. Maybe I give myself a, a pedicure or maybe a bubble bath. So when the book is in 10 o'clock, you say, She's good to see you. I miss you. Very different. Because we women provide the atmosphere. The heart and soul. Fiddler on the Roof is the most brilliant family that you really want to study. That a wife knows that the husband needs to make all the decisions in the world. And guess who makes the decisions? Remember when she's explaining to him that the daughter is going to marry a guy? Mm -hmm. Ay, 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 ay. Go see it. You know, she wakes up in the morning and she had a dream, and God knows what, she's brilliant. Because we need to treat the people not the way they are, but the way they could be mm -hmm. or should be raise the bar. Well, I always tell young couples when I meet with them before I, I do their weddings that the number one indication of a marriage that's in trouble is not a couple that argues, but a couple that avoids arguments, that avoids talking about things, that avoids bringing things out in the open, who, who lets things go too often. And so I, I agree with what you said, that we can't be afraid to bring up issues we may have with our loved ones. Thank you, very important how you finish a fight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. It's okay to start. Right? Some of you have to choose your battles, but it's okay to start them if you do it in a constructive way. It can be a very productive way. And I like what you said. It's how you end those arguments. That's right. um, I have two more questions for you, and then we'll go to the chat room, Dr. Eager. Okay. I want to talk okay. a little bit about fear and shame and how they play roles in our lives. And you describe the constant presence of shame and fear. How do these emotions define your life after liberation? And as a psychologist, how do you recommend dealing with fear and shame? When we are angry, I was interviewed by Brene Brown, and it is so important to say that we say the same thing but not the same way. She uses Texas English. <laughs> She's from Houston. And she is from Houston. She's adorable. And we say the same thing, but not the same way. I'm an immigrant, I, but we talk about fear and we talk about vulnerability, but shame is awful because unfortunately, when you are shamed many times, you grow up and you shame yourself, and you also can shame others. So I think we want to make a decision tonight that tomorrow I'm going to be very careful before I say anything and ask myself, is it important, is it necessary, and most of all, is it kind? So I learned as I grow older that we have two ears and we have one mouth. And I think God wanted us to talk less and listen more. No doubt about so, that. So anger to me, you either vent it, suppress it. In Hungary, we say to a woman, don't breathe into your breast. Very wise 
some great, great, great grandmother came up with that. <laughs> what comes out doesn't make you ill. What stays in there does. Mm. I, I didn't see anyone I was in Auschwitz 20 years. Yeah. And I'm glad I met Viktor Frankl. But underneath of anger is a lot of other emotions. A lot of pain is there. But most of all, there is a lot of fear. And fear and love does not coexist. So I promise you that if you write down all your fears from the f least anxiety producing to the most, we can just check them off one by one very quickly. You don't need years and years of therapy for that. Just don't say why. Say what, what is going on? Why is it in the past? Why is a problem past oriented world? What is in the present? And I can only touch you now. Some people don't spend enough time in the present. They either are guilty about the past or worry about the future. Worry is not concern, it's neurotic. Hmm. So it's very important to stay in the present and ask for what you want and learn to negotiate and compromise and give up the need to be right. Because I'm right, I'm only right for Edie, but I cannot be right for you. Mm. So true, so true. And people, especially in our, this day and age, can be very judgmental and like to worry about other people's there was an old saying, Rabbi Salanter said, worry, many people worry about other people's souls and their own stomachs. Instead, worry about other people's stomachs and worry about your own soul. Like worry, okay. help other people with their material well being, but don't judge other people's souls. Worry about your own soul. Everything, what you don't like in other people, try it on for size for you. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, one uh, last question. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Eager. Go I'll ahead. just say how brilliant that rabbi is, as you are too, because the rabbi does a lot of learning, a lot of learning. And you and I are still climbing the mountain, you know, and we sleep and we climb and we never stop climbing. Well, I love at 93, you just published a second book. And uh, I have, there will be a third book as well coming out soon. Pretty impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. You remind yeah. me, we have a Rabbi Emeritus here, Dr. Uh, Rabbi Jack Siegel, who's also a doctor, and he's 93. And uh -huh. he's still going, even though we haven't had a chance to see him in person because of the pandemic, he's still writing and involved and busy and uh, still physically and mentally very with it, like yourself. You know, I found a man who was in the 71st Infantry, who was one of the liberators, where I was liberated in Gunskirchen, Austria. And he's, he's 93 as well. And uh, very busy, very busy. And I even thanked him, of course, that he came. And he said that that, that camp where I was, was a atrocious place. The prisoners were eating a dead horse. And uh, I knew that cannibalism broke out. And I asked God to help me. You have to watch the sound of music because that's where I was in Austria. And I didn't want to touch human flesh. And I know that God showed me if I just look down and I remember choosing one blade of grass over and against the other. So I can't is not in my vocabulary. I run into the classroom. I'm also a former teacher. And I put I can't equals I am helpless. And then I take the T and I take the apostrophe. I can. Why? Because I think I can. Just like a choo-choo train. My daughter was in a, in a class that the IQ studied at 145. And when I visited the class, 
She was a perfectionist, and her teacher called her the little red caboose. And she was ready to leave the class because she didn't think she qualified. And I told her the first time about Auschwitz. I could not believe how I could treat my dad, granddaughter the way this teacher did. Anyway, it worked. She went back to school, and then she had to write letters to get into a college. And guess what? Was the autobiography, and the title was When the Engine, when when the caboose became an engine, and she graduated with honors from Princeton, wow. and she got a PhD at UCLA, and she's a professor of psychology now. So you got to go, be very careful in terms of who you listen to and not to allow anybody to ever murder your spirit. No doubt about it, and, and, and I can't agree with you more. And let me ask you what you're, what do you do now? How do you stay busy? How do you keep going? Um, oh, I love the Zoom. I don't have to get dressed. All I have to do <laughs> is just take an escada, escada something. And my father told me when I get dressed, I'm going to be the best dressed girl in town because she was a tailor and became a couturier. So I say, Papa, watch me. I dress well, and so I am very happy not to go to the airport and not to travel and stand in line. I am, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. And you have, very, do you, you have how many, uh, how many children do you have? And I have three children. I have five grandchildren, and I have seven great grandsons. I just had. Twins. Can you see my twins? Yeah. Congratulations. Mazel tov. Isn't it? Yeah, that was my holiday card. That's fantastic. I love that. Isn't it wonderful? Uh, yesterday, I talked to a wonderful, wonderful pregnant woman and uh, asked her, was it an accident? And she said, no, she's going to have as many children as she can to replace the ones who died. So my tears just came that love is not what you feel, is what you do. One time I was invited to a rabbi's home for dinner, and there were 10 children. I never met a healthier, more loving, kind, family with each other, no sibling rivalry, forget about it. But they didn't have TV in the house. They had books in the rooms, no TV and, and rules. So I hope you can come up with rules so you can really feel very good afterwards that this was a good time out period to regroup and redecide, not going back to have a new beginning that you give birth, not the new you, but the real you. Most of us gave up our own true self to fit the dynamics in a family. Do you know that firstborn children marry firstborn children? And you know what they do? They have two bosses. And they want to, I don't know if you can relate to that, but usually middle children are peacemakers. And do you know how you call youngest children? Charming manipulators. <laughs> I think you are talking about my family. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I it's, think you got it just right. <laughs> um, I got to ask, what was it like? You met some famous people in your life. What was it like to meet Oprah Winfrey? Oh, I have. I have. And uh, she asked me, how did I experience liberation? And I told her I was among the dead. And then all of a sudden, 
I felt someone holding my hand. And I looked up and I saw big lips. And she said to me, was he black? Yeah. And then I looked up and I saw tears coming out of the eyes and M&Ms from his hand. People always send me, please don't send me M&Ms. Please, please don't. <laughs> I got M&Ms with my picture on it even. But that's how I wish I could meet that man. It, it was a man of color and I, I wish I could meet him. So in our closing minutes, Dr. Eager, tell us a little bit about your new book. Um, I think it's a 12 step book that you just wrote. Um, the gift is uh, after the choice, people ask me to write a book that is more practical. So there is a chapter and after there is practical what you can do now about it. Like, why don't you perhaps recognize that your beliefs are very limiting? See, some people travel very little. They don't know, for instance, that the largest Jewish population today is in Germany. So don't, don't be so fast. And not all Germans were Nazis. It doesn't mean you want to deny it or run from it or fight it. But I wish people could travel more out of their little place um, in wherever, wherever they are and, and do something every day that they have previously avoided. So that's why I like to be a, I, don't call me a shrink, call me a stretch. Viktor Frankl and I were talking about that we stretch people's possibilities. And that's what hopefully I do. I challenge you to ask yourself, when did your childhood end? And you have a very practical ways to reading the book, to find a way to look at the same thing from a different perspective. And the name of your second book is called The Gift. Yes. And I know we can find that on Amazon and I know it's a book I'm gonna pick up soon. Let me um, ask two last questions. It, we, a lot of people said some really nice things in the chat room. Um, I want you to know everyone's writing how inspired you are, how inspiring you are, and um, just your words of wisdom are so helpful and what a pleasure it is to listen to you and to read your books. One person asked, is your husband still alive? Um, my book is goes until 1986. My my husband had TB when I met him, and the TB came back and took his life in 1993. And people ask me also, did you love your husband? And I said, love? I was very skinny. I was very, very lonely, and I was very, very hungry. And this guy bought me Hungarian salami. So I married him. Most of our survivors got married very quickly. Very quickly. And I got pregnant. And the doctor wanted to have an abortion immediately. And I told the doctor, I want to give life. Thank God I have a brilliant daughter who is a brilliant psychologist working with children, working with sports all over the world. And her husband got the Nobel Prize in economics. So get a second opinion. And, and so I am, uh, I'm just so happy that I got a second opinion. After two girls, my son was born and I just got a book about Rabbi Akiva Eger, and my late husband was so, so happy. Finally, we're gonna carry the name, but my son didn't, didn't, didn't develop the way my daughters did. 
He didn't sit up, he didn't walk, he hardly spoke, and I asked for a second opinion. And I went to Johns Hopkins, and a beautiful neurologist told me, after a week's examination, your son is going to be what you make of him. And of course, I'm shaking. And he says he's going to need speech therapy, occupational therapy, and then he's going to do everything everyone else does. It's going to take him longer to get there. My son John graduated as a top 10 student from the University of Texas. That is, you see, my, my hero. That you never give up and you'll do everything you can. If I can't get in the front door, I'm going to try the side window. And if that doesn't work, I'll look for the chimney. Um, never give up. Never ever do everything is possible to do what's humanly possible. Yeah. And that's what you've done for your 93 years and, and sounds like yes. you're continuing to do it. It, it is course. inspiration. Last question, someone wrote, um, and I think it's an important one for all of us. There's less and less survivors still here. Unfortunately, we are losing too many survivors every day. So someone wrote, um, I wanted to ask you, have you met Holocaust deniers? And if you did, what would you tell them? I think the best thing to tell them is never deny their truth. Because Ahmadijida did not read Plato. And Plato said, you have to think of a lie. It's got to be a big one. And then you repeat it, repeat it until people believe it. Our biggest enemy is ignorance. Ignorance, question authority, authority rather than blindly adhere. And so why don't you find the nearest German consulate possibly Washington, and they're going to tell you. Yeah. You know, Who's remarkably German? today, Israel's best friend in Europe is Germany. And Germany has done a very good job teaching the if world. If you go to Israel, you are picked up in a Mercedes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I think it's very important for us to empower each other with our differences. So you can be you and I can be I, but together we're going to be much stronger. Well, thank yeah. you again, Dr. Eager. This was the perfect talk for the Passover holiday. And I want to thank the women of the sisterhood. I know uh, let's give you a big round of applause. This is absolutely just fantastic. Thank you. We're going to gonna... send you my book. We're going to say, if you, if you, <laughs> this is my assistant, this little precious girl. Katie. Hello. <laughs> I, I will send it to Jennifer, to your address at the, at we, the show. Thank yeah? you. Yeah. We okay. would love that. And then if Dr. Eager is ever able to come to Texas again, your home state, we would I love, love to have to you in Houston at Bethia Shern. I love enchiladas with the tomatillo sauce. It's so good. <laughs> we get plenty of that here in Houston, as you know. I know. I know. I was there. I spoke to the wonderful women uh, um, who are heading the the YPO. The YPO, but they also are very, very friendly with the people who build the museum yeah. in Houston. They have a yeah. beautiful museum, and I was fortunate yeah. enough to meet the. Yeah, I the know it was a great event. We have I a love great Houston. Awesome. I love you, Stan. Dr. Igor Hagsameach, good end of Passover. Again, thank you for everyone for joining. Thank you to our sisterhood. Thank you to Jennifer Rosenzweig. And it's a pleasure having you again, and we hope to see you soon. Shalom. Shalom. And Lehi Bye-bye. Just a minute.